Hi, everybody. Dave Chalmers here, Chief Commercial Officer from LMN. I wanted to welcome everybody to today's webinar on bookkeeping standards, building confidence in your financials. We have two incredible speakers with us today. But just before I introduce them, would like to remind everybody, um, if you have a question uh, at any point in time during the presentation, please use the chat window. Uh, you can type your question in there. Uh, our speakers may get to your question during the presentation. We will also have a question and answers um, at the end. So welcome everybody. I'd like to introduce to you Jim Kelly and James New. Both are founding principals of McFarland Stanford and each of them brings over 25 years of green industry experience uh, to the table. Jim leads McFarland Stanford's executive coaching practice. He was the COO for many years at a very large landscape company. He's also the former chairman of Government Affairs Committee for the National Association of Landscape Professionals. Executive coach, at the Grow Group, um, and Jim is extremely passionate about helping green industry executives achieve their best results. Also joining us on the webinar is James New, or sorry, Jason New. Jason leads McFarland Stanford's operational effectiveness practice. Uh, he was also the VP of Garden Management for a number of very high-end landscape companies is also the former lead of the education committee at the National Association of Landscape Professionals. And Jason loves to drive uh, transformation and, and achieve results. And given his experience, um, he's, a, he's a sought after uh, speaker and coach uh, within the industry. So Jim, Jason, thank you so much for your time and over to you. Thank you, Dave. We're gonna kick this off. We can move over to the next slide, Jason. We're gonna to talk today about uh, bookkeeping standards, building confidence in your financials. We've been coaching now for coming up on six years, and we always thought when we got into the coaching side of things that we wouldn't be spending so much time talking about finance. Um, mm -hmm. We spent a lot of time talking about uh, the day-to-day -day operations, and we spent a lot of time talking about finance. So we're Today, I'm going to speak to you about building confidence in your financials so that you get really excited about your P&L, your balance sheet, and have confidence in what you're reading and is, is everything it needs to be. So before we get started, bio for me is I've been in the green industry since 2006. I was a client in the green industry um, while building a home. That picture of me on the bottom left is, yes, me. I was the, the picture of the uh, of the merger between FedEx and Kinko's that was many many years ago but I was running international sales and marketing became great friends with my landscaper and uh, moonlighted for a fire pit uh, to help out with some finance and so in diving into finance I never dreamed the cash flow that would be in the green industry and I learned a ton through that the industry impressed me and uh, sure enough went in to help lead an organization where we grew a firm from just under four million dollars to over 28 million dollars in seven short years like i mentioned just a second ago we've been coaching now coming up on six years we have over 200 clients we've got a bookkeeping practice a recruiting practice of course the coaching practice that we talked about earlier and uh, we speak so excited to be here with you today and uh, i'm married with two kids i've got a 15 year old daughter and an 11 year old daughter jason yeah glad to be here with you today like many of you, I, I grew up in landscaping and I loved it. This is what I wanted to do. So in high school, I had a, an ag class that I took as an elective, um, realized that landscaping was a, a career path and went to school, Tarleton State University with a Bachelor of Science in Hort with a business emphasis. Spent the early part of my career in the in the big corporations at Valley Crest, Brickman, just learning how to do business and how to, you know, where my operations background came from. Um, I met Jim in 2007. In 2007, I was planning on leading the industry and uh, found that there was a, a love of small business and wanting to grow something from something that's smaller to something much greater and had an opportunity to do that with them at Southern, uh, the, the Dallas-based company. And from there in 2014, where we co-founded McFarland Stanford, we have been running nonstop ever since, just loving what we do in this industry and uh, excited about what we're here to share with you today. Um, oh, I, 
got to say I'm married, two kids, also have a 12-year-old daughter and nine-year-old son. So let's go into dive right in. Our agenda today, there's seven topics here, the list that we want to cover to be able to dive deep into um, some experiences and some best practices so that you can go through and, and eliminate any doubt and create accuracy in the books that you work with. So it's, it's so accurate that you get to a point where you have confidence in sharing this with your banker, with a leadership team, with potentially team members in the future. And these are the things that are going to help you drive success in your business by being accurate every single day. So let's go right into bookkeeping. Bookkeeping is a daily practice. And this is what is going to help you build confidence in your numbers. So let's dive straight into the processes that we believe that are daily transactions. LMN time. LMN time for all team members. Um, so what does this mean? Well, we go through a process where we run into the coaching aspect with clients that we work with. Uh, we see that we wait till the 11th hour, till payroll is due. We're tracking down timesheets. We're tracking down LMN time that hasn't been audited or updated. And we get to a point where these things haven't been processed on a daily basis. And so we're, we're trying to remember what those crews have been doing for the last week or the last two days, or the last three days. And that challenges us because it's sometimes that we're making things up because the guys cannot remember. And so if we process this by 10 a.m. daily for the previous day's work, we know that we're tracking time accurately and we're getting the right numbers in place and we're doing this daily. That's going to provide accurate data so that the payroll can be run correctly and we're not chasing numbers. Okay, so credit card, credit card receipts. Many of us have run into this, and I've done it myself. We have a glove box full of receipts that we haven't turned in for a week, or perhaps maybe even worse than that, maybe a month. And so we don't process these daily. They end up adding up, and we don't remember exactly what we bought for which job or which project or, or where it goes. And so we spend an enormous amount of time trying to do this uh, when we could just take care of it in the moment. So instead, take a picture of your receipt after you made the purchase, after you had that gas fill up, Take a picture of that receipt immediately. Send yourself an email with what it was for. If it was project-based, put the client name and the project name in vault, and then you've got your tracking right there. You don't need to chase down receipts at a later time. Uh, vendor bills. Vendor bills are something that when we start going into a vendor bill, you know, our, our goal is we process this same day it comes in. And so bills that come in, that may come in, you know, two weeks later, three weeks later, we are tracking these things the day they came in so that we were having it in our system. We know for the things that are going out, our cash flow going out, we know what is coming up. And that is going to be super accurate for in and out cash flows. We talk about that later in later slides. Um, client payments. You know, if somebody pays us a check, don't let the, the check sit with you. And for two days, don't process, don't deposit. You know, we're expecting that we do these things on a daily basis so that we can have accurate numbers of cash. So process the fact that we're getting our, our, our payment from our client with a credit card, we process it today. We have a check deposit or a check payment, we process it today, we make, it, we make the run to the bank, and we put in a deposit for today. That's allowing us to know what our cash is on a daily basis and keeping live data. Uh, email and text responses. Do I love this one? You know, for many times we, we were training people coming into organizations um, yeah, we, we treat communication as a big key thing, but a lot of times we didn't have boundaries or ways to keep people in check with this. So we came up with a five to 10 rule. The five to 10 rule for us was the ability to say, if any email or text comes in today from a client, from an internal team member, or anyone in this process, before 5 p.m., we're gonna respond to it the same day. Even if I don't have an answer, even if there's um, you know, a delay in something we need, we're gonna acknowledge it came in. Hey, we're gonna get you an answer. This is when we can have an answer to you by for the same day. If it's after 5 p.m., we realize there's you know personal lives involved. So we get to by 10 a.m. the next morning. That shows a sense of urgency. It shows that we are making that a priority for our client, for our team members, and then we don't become the bottleneck. So we believe email and text responses need to be followed by the five to 10 rule. I wanna add something there quick before you, you transition there, Jason. And yeah, it, absolutely. This, this stuff sounds elementary is um, actually go back to the slide right before we're looking at here. Um, the transactions daily. I mean, people are like, yeah, process time. I don't need to do this. Vendor bills. Well, like once I get them approved, I put them in the system. The reality is, is we're 
once we, the whole point of this presentation is building confidence in your financials. You've got to get this information in the system. If you're going to use your system and you've had, you know, vendor bills that came in last Friday and today happens to be a Thursday later and you're waiting for an approval, you have no idea by looking at your financials whether the true reality of the fact of what you owe at this point or, what, you know, what's coming due. So all these pieces here, it's about it's like brushing your teeth every day. This is the daily practice of bookkeeping, making sure you keep up with these items and uh, so that your financials are correct. And trust me, we are all guilty of this, but the more we do this, the more we get on par with this, then we've got a lean, mean team that is running on things that are live information so we can make better decisions. What does this lead to? This leads to the reporting that we all expect and that we want. And we start going into something that is regular bookkeeping items. So payroll, payroll is done weekly. If all the things that are done daily are done appropriately and accurately, then our payroll can be ran. Accounts receivable. We believe we do those on Mondays and Thursdays. Our practice here to get collections in the door and to make sure we're receiving cash on a regular basis for anything that's outstanding over 30 days, we make calls or we recommend you make calls every Monday saying, hey, you know, we understand you're past due or for better terms, you might say, hey, we wanna make sure you have received an invoice. We have a, an outstanding balance here. We're gonna go ahead and resend this to you. When can we expect to receive payment? I will be following up with you on Thursday if I haven't received payment by then. So there's a friendly follow-up every Monday and Thursday until you get paid. This is a practice that you can start making sure as long as your daily practices are accurate, you can be confident in your Monday, Thursday calls on receivables. You know, accounts payable. That should be something that's done weekly. Account reconciliations, when you're talking about bank reconciliations and credit card reconciliations. You're going into the scenario where you want to make sure all of your information on a monthly reporting basis is accurate and ready to go. So you're doing that once a month. Then you're closing the books at the end of each month to making sure that you've got an accurate profit and loss statement on how your business is running. And then your tax filings are quarterly and annual. If we're not doing the daily things, these reports become more and more difficult to operate your business. And this is where we get in trouble when we really don't know how our business is running. Jim, why don't you take us through cash versus accrual? Cash versus accrual accounting, um, it, it's it's one of the things that tends to trip some clients up along the way. And certainly once we learn it, you understand it really well. But the reality is for those of you that are not familiar with cash versus accrual accounting, cash is for purposes of, in our, our opinion, for tax. It's it's um, it's how you file your taxes um, typically and you pay you know your income tax based on uh, the cash received versus the cash spent and what's left over is your profit. That does not help you on a daily basis understand exactly what's happening with your business. If you want an accurate reflection of what's happening in your business, you need to be using accrual accounting. I wouldn't have any reports set to cash except when I'm maybe talking to my accountant about paying quarterly taxes, for instance. Otherwise, I wouldn't even think about it. And the cash purchase here, let's say, when does cash change hands? Like if we purchase something, it, it, it's in your cash p &L, it's going to be a, an expense, right? And if you get paid but with... Uh, you know, a payment for an invoice from a client that's cash received, that minus that expense equals your profit. Well, if you, um, I'm gonna take you through an example here in just a second. Accrual accounting is about making sure that you're billing for the work as it's completed and you're expensing also any of the materials or labor against it, and for that matter, rent, utilities, and things like that too. So let's move on to the next slide. I'm gonna give you an example to think about. So we're gonna take, uh, we're gonna look through these four bullet points. So we're gonna send a 10, sent, uh, we are sent a $10,000 invoice, excuse me, we sent out a $10,000 invoice for landscape install started and completed this month of April. We spent $7,800 in labor for that install. We also paid a $75 bill in computer fees for bills and we received a thousand dollars from a client for an order that was invoiced last month. So let's take a look at what the different P&Ls would look like cash versus accrual. Sorry. Yeah. There, there we go. Effects on cash flow. So if we're looking at a cash flow transaction here, let me just get my examples up here to make sure I get my numbers right. But if if we're looking at the cash example, if we just received a thousand dollars cash from a client for a job that's done, even though it was a prior month, it would show in a cash PL. The cost of goods sold, we we're talking about that labor of seven thousand eight hundred dollars that um, we paid out would go against that income. So we'd have a gross profit of negative sixty eight hundred. The expenses of $75 for paying that computer fee would show that we have a net profit of negative $6,875. Like, hold the bar, like we're, we're shutting down. We have no money. That makes no sense. Mm -hmm. The flip side is, is if you look at 
the work that you did and what you billed for, which is the $10,000, the $1,700 in labor that went against it, we had a gross profit of $2,200, which is 22%. Not exactly the best thing we talk about, but for purposes here, $2,200 is fine. We had no expenses because that expense for the computer bill would have been done in a prior month too. And our profit for the work that we did this month is $2,200. A much better way of looking at the business, once again, only look at your books this way if you really truly want to go understand what's going on in your books and in the business. Go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. And so how does this look like in QuickBooks? Well, you can you know, default your reports to either print versus cash versus accrual. I will tell you that more than half the clients that we go into, the default reports happen to be spitting out via cash out of QuickBooks. We tell you, turn it on to accrual. You can default it to always be accrual. But if you can't get the, the default changed, we just say during the report, when you pull up the P&L, the top of QuickBooks Online, you can see it. You can click it to accrual. And at the bottom would be to your desktop versions. Just make sure you click the accrual button to get those P&Ls out the right effective way. Nice. Thank you, Jim. Let's go into our next topic, recognition of revenue and expenses. Remember, this is, as we build confidence in our financials, this is the idea of make, making sure how we're tracking things, that we're tracking things on a daily basis, that we're tracking it accurately. We're going to take you through some best practices that we believe and how we're recognizing revenue on our accrual basis. So, uh, invoicing clients in the month that the work is executed. So for those things that, that happen, this, this happens quite a bit. So we go into invoicing in the month that work is executed. A lot of times we delay invoicing because we get busy. And let's just say we finish all of our projects in the month of March and we're sending out invoices in April. Well, we should be recognizing that the invoicing needs to match the work when it was performed. So we should be making those March invoices. That's a very simple exercise is making sure that our dates line up. So the invoice is on a regular schedule that shows up on the month that we did the work. And that's how it will match up in your QuickBooks file. Um, progress billing. We love the idea of doing progress billing so that you don't get so far behind. This helps speed up cash flow. This helps make sure that you're getting the things that are happening in the month that they're supposed to be happening. So then if you've got projects that are carrying over and, and whether they're time and materials billing or whether they're um, longer term projects, do progress billing every 15th and 30th of the month and have your clients get used to the idea of that we're going to do some portion of progress billing. This is we talk big about that. So we're talking, you know, some 15th and 30th is a fantastic way to do it. Another way to do it is just put a line in the sand that every Tuesday you do all your billing from the week before. Um, once right. again, the immediacy of getting this done is fantastic. Um, when we, we, we look at invoicing from a weekly basis as opposed to a daily basis most times because people can't get their hands around that like we would expect with receipts, vendor bills, and things like that. But just get yourself on a regular system of getting the invoices out the door and you've got a line in the sand to figure out when you get it done. Agreed. That's a great point. Um, client deposits. You know, client deposits are not, not recognized as income. Um, it's also not considered a negative receivable. So if you're having challenges of how you're tracking your deposits, it is a liability. It's a current liability. And so we can have, we can send you, if you reach out to us, we're going to give you some contact information at the end of the slideshow. If you reach out to us, we can send you how that should look inside your books and tracking client deposits the right way so that you're fundamentally recognizing revenue the way it should be recognized. All right. And let's be sure to match income recognition and the expense incurred to generate that income. What does that mean? It means that when we're doing, let's say, a, a, a bill comes in, a bill comes in from tree work that you were doing on a project, and it was a portion of what you were doing in March, and the vendor bills you April the 12th. On April the 12th, you're going to start processing this because you're processing things daily. Um, we should not label that invoice from our vendor or that bill from our vendor for the 12th. We should label it March 31st because when it was a work done, it was done in the month of March. So date the vendor bills back to the actual uh, time frame that the work was performed in the same month. And that way we could recognize the expense and the revenue in the same month. All right, so let's look at a bill receipt. Well, shoot, I jumped ahead. That's what I'm looking at as far as date expense in the month for the revenue, sorry. <laughs> That's the next slide. Um, so what about payroll? Payroll, I mean, Jim, this is a great example. How do we do this? We, so let's look at payroll. We're gonna go tomorrow, which is April the 10th, for payroll for last week. Two days of last week was gonna be in March. Three days right. of last week was gonna be in April. How in right. the world are we gonna recognize revenue for payroll when it's split up that way over a month? 
Well, most people, when they're using their P&L, just explain it when they're looking at month over month or year over year, like, oh, that was a five pay period month, right? And it's just, it becomes a yeah, but we don't like yeah, buts. Um, there's another general journal transaction where it may not be perfect, but the reality is you just mentioned two days, we're in March, three days in April. The reality is we want to move 40% of payroll from today to the month of March so that we're accurately reflecting the labor that was intended in the month of March uh, versus what was in April, because there's no reason April should take that on. Vice versa, if you look at a week back, which would have been like April the 3rd, that payroll 100% should have been in the March time period because it was 100% about the labor that was pushed back into March. That's a, This is a life-saving transaction. Um, we'll, we'll, for those who are interested in getting past the yeah buts on that, along with the you know showing your deposits as a customer liability, we can share with you the journal transaction to make sure you get the payroll into the appropriate period so that accrual financials will accurately reflect the income the expenses, including labor, and the time period where the work was was committed. So that's it. Yep. And remember, cash changing hands is not indicative of an expense being incurred or revenue being recognized. So <laughs> if you're doing things with cash, um, be conscious of how tracking and, and making sure that that shows up where it needs to show up. Right. Chart of accounts. The chart of accounts, you can go to the next page on this one, Jason. The chart of accounts is, is minimal, but it, it's funny to me. Um, and we're going to show you a great uh, PL here and a balance sheet coming up later in the presentation. But a chart of accounts should be an accurate reflection of, of what's going on in the business. And we're going to dive into how you look at a chart of accounts later in this presentation and how you look at classes. But big picture when it comes to chart of accounts, it's each line item in your general ledger, right? It's the, the items that you expense. Uh, or, or earn revenue against in QuickBooks, right? So here it is, it's major categories of income, cost of goods sold, expense, assets, liabilities, and owner's equity. Um, you know, I was taught in business school uh, at SMU that your, your chart of your chart of accounts, your, excuse me, your P&L should never be longer than two pages. And if your balance sheet can get to one, it's even better. It's an accurate reflection of your professional ability to truly know what's going on in your business. And what I mean by that is, is every revenue line item should not have a separate uh, a revenue line item for snow, or a separate line item for um, maintenance for construction, you know, it's all put into revenue line item and it's one line item. And you'll see this as further examples as we go through the presentation. But the reality is if you want to see a particular line item of financial data on a report, you, you should have an account line item for that. But the question is, do you really need to know that level of detail? And we'll see that as we go through the presentation. So, you know, why is your chart of accounts important? It's tracking what's important to your business. I just mentioned that it's assessing your health of the business. So that you, when you do look at uh, time periods over past time periods, you see whether things are higher or lower and you can make effective business decisions and it helps you develop the metrics that can be approved to help your bottom line. And the last piece here, the caution, too many accounts dilute the data. I know that Liz uh, Helton, who runs our bookkeeping practice for us, who's had 20 years of E&Y experience and went to Duke and Rice and she tells us all the time she just can't stand long pages of information like that. So it's just too much to process. You can really get your hands on great information, not only by using truly your P&L, but I mean your data and LMN is going to give you a lot of that information too. So that's the principle of all this. You know, you can only manage what you measure. I mean, this is, you know, if you want to have immaculate books to hand over your CPA and get your taxes done, you know, timely, you just need to make sure that the categorization of the information is correct. We use this line all the time. You can only manage what you measure. If you're not measuring it, there's nothing to manage. Um, a lot of times when you print out P&Ls, people cannot use it to make, to, to affect what's happening in um, the business that month. Part of the, the process of managing is, is being able to use your P&L and your balance sheet for that matter during the period to affect change inside your business during the period, not after your period. If you wait until after your books close, and let's just say you close your books in the 15th of the month past the month that you're looking at, if you notice any discrepancies for that or, or big uh, indicators that things are wrong, you're already 45 days into this mess and you're you're lucky if you're looking at it that date. So the moral of the story is, is back to the daily processing. You should be able to manage through a P&L, if you're keeping your books up to date on a daily basis, actions during that month to affect the outcome of a P&L before you even get to the end of the month. P&L example, look at this. This is like probably, I don't know, 35 beautiful lines. Um, you know, 300,000 in revenue and a net profit of $64,000 net operating income. Um, this is real simple to understand. Um, it may not be as detailed as things that you've seen in the past when it comes to a P&L, but as we teach about classes later in this presentation, you're going to be able to have a P&L for each department. Even if you're a small business, 
less than a million in sales, knowing by what trade line or product line each income is being produced and the expenses against that versus things like overhead and things like that will help you. But anyway, I just wanted to show you this from a standpoint of the simplicity of what a good P&L will look like. And the next slide will be a balance sheet, Jason. If you bring mm -hmm. me over to that, once again, that's probably, that's 30 lines too. And then uh, the big pictures here is we've got 110,000 in current assets, 13,000 in the bank, 90,000 in receivables. And, but let's look at that net income down there for this current period. You have $55,000 for this period that we're looking at. Uh, and we're, this is a pretty financially sound company. So I, I can overlook something like this. A banker can look at something like this. I mean, your P&L is your ultimate dashboard at the end of the day. That's the only dashboard that can be considered one business to another business to another business. And that's so green industry focused, but this is really how you're measured. Classes, using classes. One of the most important things that I learned early in my career is going into how you're tracking things for your team. And we're going to talk about classes today. So if you're not familiar with it, we'll take you through a little bit more detail on it. Uh, but to baseline this, if you're wondering why the profit and loss and the other one wasn't showing, my gosh, where's all my services? All I saw was a sell of product income. I mean, I don't know what that is. So this is where we're going to show you where you label the things that you want to label. So Classes are frequently represent what your divisions, your departments, product lines, overhead, you know, meaningful segments in your business. You know, some examples. Let me take you through a few. Landscaping, maintenance, irrigation, snow, uh, tree service, lawn fertilization. You name it, you can make a class as what's considered a way of tracking its own individual. So big picture wise, this is a department in the company that you feel like at some point you're going to assign the leadership to, and it's going to have it, it stands alone to make a profit center for the company. Mm -hmm. So this division, this department can be tracked with a class instead of QuickBooks. It's a major way to know you can start getting accurate information, and we'll take you through what this looks like in the next couple of slides. Um, overhead. Why in the world is there overhead? What does what does overhead mean in classes? And so the way we describe this is. If you're working with an overhead piece, these are the things when you have departments, let's say you have landscaping, maintenance, snow, and you decide you're gonna sell the snow department to another person and you're just done with snow. Um, the over the head of the company would remain with you, right? You're paying ownership, you're paying leadership, you're paying the rent of the building, you're paying the expenses of running the day-to-day -day shop and the, and the land that you have. Even though you sell the department snow, everything else remains the overhead piece that you have to do to run the company. So right. that's why we like having a class called overhead, so that you know there's a dedicated, committed expense to how the company is ran. All right, so let's look at a quick example of what the classes will do for you. Okay, so this is a profit and loss statement by class, December 2019. All right, so let's just go to the total real quick. We see a total of, we built out for December 158,617.56. We had a net profit or a net income of 26,000. If you do the math, it's 16.8% net profit. If I look at overall, which is the way it, traditionally we see a lot of people doing it, my gosh, we had a fantastic month, 16.8% net profit. That's above what our, our budget was. Our budget was 15%. Well, we wouldn't have noticed the things that are ahead is, my gosh, snow really carried us. Thank goodness for snow. I'm glad we didn't sell that department. Um, <laughs> maintenance, maintenance made money. That's a good thing, that's a good scenario. And construction tanked it. Oh my gosh, we need to dive in to understand how we're going to do better with construction in the month of December if we have a lot of snow, because that's obviously what we're seeing here. Um, also, I know that our overhead is costing us 31,894 a month. Mm -hmm. And is that consistent? Is there anything we can do to improve that? Is there anything we can do to be more effective with our overhead? Um, these are the kind of things that you can start tracking and managing if you can separate things by class and looking at each of these classes as its own profit and loss, as its own p and I'm gonna add um, something before you go off that page, Jason. Uh, Big big picture on this one is like construction. Like Jason said, yeah, they tanked at a negative twelve thousand dollars. My first thought here is not that they suck, for lack of better terms. It's probably we didn't build something, right? 
It, it, you can't have $54,000 in cost of goods sold and only bill 41,000. Now that is possible, but that is usually the rarity. But when you're sitting here closing your books for the month, chances are I'd be looking at this going, we did not bill something, something happens to be off. So if, if to Jason's point earlier, if I was only looking at the 26,000 uh, net income on the total or the fact that our gross profit was 63,158, I would not be looking for missed billing. It looks okay. So the ability of, of printing it out like this tells you so much and, and, and helps you highlight what may be missing or where you got a, you got a huge problem. So. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? And Jim, one more example for the whole matching expenses. Mm -hmm. If the cost of goods sold is based on vendor bills that came in that we're just plugging in on, based on their deal, you know, that could have been in November when the work was performed or in the cost of goods sold when the, when the, when the plants were installed but we are vendor bill, we didn't track it the right way. These are great scenarios and why we're saying we should match expenses and income. And that's right. this is a great way to look at it. Great call out, Jim. We always say, don't, don't bill if you don't have a receipt for it. So that'll help you also not cause uh, yourself to get yourself in that uh, situation too. So great points. Absolutely. Um, actually, how do we get to classes? Jim, maybe you can walk us through this. I know you're a QuickBooks Pro Advisor. You might be Diamond, I think, at this point. Yeah, I'm not sure that. what they call you. I don't know. I got to take another set of tests by the end of August 31st, according to the <laughs> this week. But uh, yeah, we'll get that done between now and then. This is if you're not using classes already and you just have that final column that we're talking about, you have to turn on classes inside of QuickBooks. So QuickBooks desktop there to the left, you need to make sure you click preferences and your accounting preferences and your company preferences, and you can turn on class tracking. That's the example on the bottom left. And on the upper right um, would be for QuickBooks Online. It's in your company settings. It's on the main page settings and the categories, tracking classes, turning it on. That easy. And then well, actually, once you turn those on, you then have to go set up the class names. So that would be the snow that Jason sold, the construction and the, and the maintenance division and things like that he was discussing earlier. So the first thing is turning it on and, of course, then going and creating the classes you want to track. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. Let's look at reasons to reconcile. You know, reasons to reconcile, this is one of those things that I don't know if y'all remember, I may be dating myself, that people used to reconcile their checking accounts in the back of their bank statements and they had this, you know, money in the account, money out of the account, did it balance, were we missing any transaction things? It's it's pretty, pretty prehistoric. People have tended to avoid that by just looking at a daily balance inside their checking account as of late. And if you move over to the next um, uh, slide here, Jason, uh, reconciliation is probably one of the most valuable exercises that any bookkeeper on your team or if you outsource to bookkeeping, it takes care of and it should be done within five days of the close of the month. And you, you reconcile things like bank statements, your charge of cards, you even reconcile things like your um, your notes for your vehicles, et cetera, because it is amazing to us even to this day how many transactions in this automatic world get missed along the way. And what I mean by that is, is that uh, there was a, <laughs> I did not reconcile until August and found last year in our own books um, that two weeks of data for the month of June on our Citibank Visa MasterCard didn't come through. And I would have never seen that. I would All those expenses did not get billed to customers. I had to put my, my head between the legs and say, hey, we missed some things that we're supposed to pass on to you. It was just a whole miss. And so it happens, Not that's one example. It happened to us with our banking account last year. And then certainly inside of our bookkeeping practice with our clients, Liz mentions this all the time, transactions just get missed. So it validates the data entry, it catches the download errors that I was mentioning there just a second. Um, there are financial institution errors more than you would believe. Um, surprises happen to be things like, oh, somebody, you know, uh, paid a vendor through an ACH that you weren't aware of. It's amazing how these things happen. And um, anyway, the reconciling your all of those things help you monitor your cash flow and deter fraud. It monitors the health of your business. Don't ignore this one. This is why we put this as one of the seven, because I think this is the one that's most easily ignored and not heard of. And truthfully, it can be done if it's done properly and you keep up with your books on a daily basis. I think a reconciliation should take you for a checking account, honestly, less than a minute if all the transactions happen to have been in there throughout the month, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'll have to fess up, Jim. And those two yeah. weeks of missing data, that's where I bought my Sonos speakers for the house and put it on the company card. Yeah. It's called a <laughs> Jason. Sorry, yeah, that's taxable income, buddy. Um, <laughs> All right.
All right, reconciling, just making this is the two screens. Once again, on the bottom left is your QuickBooks desktop version where you reconcile and you need to get that number to zero, which is in the side of that red box. And on the right-hand side is the QuickBooks online version where I'm looking at that one. I'm, I'm $23,762 off. Something's missing somewhere, somehow, and guess what? I got to find it. That's where you'll find the mistakes that may have happened along the way. Utopia is these balance 95% of the time when you go straight into the reconciliation process, but it, there are misses. It's crazy how often they're much more regular than I would ever expect in this day and age, but they happen to be out there. Next. How your profit and loss is your dashboard to the rest of the world. And the reason we're right to the rest of the world, this is the one only thing that matters when you start working into how your business is doing. If you're going to present your numbers to a bank, if you are bankable, if people are going to look at your company as maybe you're selling it and you're going for purchase at some point, if you're going to share numbers with your leadership team or with your future team members, um, the only thing that really truly matters in your scoreboard is your profit and loss statement. And that's why we wanna see this as used as your dashboard. And here's some things that we look at. So are your invoicing as work as performed? Yes, we've, we've covered that. If expenses are higher than your income, you may have missed an invoice, just like Jim had covered just a little bit earlier, you know, or maybe we didn't put that in the right category in the right month. Period. Yep. Are you collecting an invoice as a, and the amount's timely? So in this collections piece, this is the cash flow of what we're doing in our businesses. This is super important what we do single, every single day. Um, we have outstanding invoices. If we're not looking at these things, if we're not paying attention that these uh, are being logged and, and invoices are being uh, put in accurately and timely, um, we could be a lot of cash flow missing without looking at our collections. Expenses are expected. Our expenses match and the income that they are produced and the so this is, of course, aligning which months are supposed to be happening. This is this really shows you, are you making money? Are you bankable, right? What, and, and bankable, you know, it's a, it's a good discussion. Bankable is, is whether someone's going to loan you money to buy that piece of equipment. Are they going to loan you that money to buy that piece of land that you're going to put your future site on? You know, financials mm -hmm. are something that, you know, people generally don't enter the industry because they are financial gurus. And what I mean by that is, is that, that there's, there's an offset to that. And so people are at times dismayed and taken back by this, but I believe that everybody can get a hold of a PL and a balance sheet. And through times like this that we're discussing today and using your financials on a daily basis, you'll get that comfort level. And truly this will be your dashboard that you mentioned, Jason. Absolutely. Well, there's a report we're gonna show you in a moment. We're gonna talk a little bit about it before we ju just jump into it. So month over month changes. What are we looking for? So month over month changes. If we're starting to track expenses or line items, let's just say cost of goods sold, I'll give you an example. Equipment repairs and maintenance. We wanna look at our month over month changes. So from month to month, are we staying steady with what we think we're spending on this? Or is it starting to show spikes? And so if you're starting to look at this for the first time, we expect that we're going anything that's plus or minus 20% change, we need to understand why. Are we spending way more than we, than we need to be spending on equipment repair and maintenance? Are we spending way less because, oh my gosh, we're, you know, our guys are ignoring it. We should be doing our normal routine, you know, filter changes, oil changes, and all these things that we're not doing. The bigger, you know, plus or minus 20% on specific line items, month over month, you should be looking at. Now, even more importantly, looking month to month over month and then versus the prior year. So if we're looking at, you know, March of 2020, I'm also comparing February of 2020. I'm also comparing March of 2019. If I look yeah. at those things, I'm going to see a very good trend in what we're looking at. I've got a pattern of I'm hitting all my heavy expenses the month of February, and then in March they dip down, so this is pretty normal for me. Okay, so I'm starting to see that that's a trend. Or, man, this is not looking at all like there's any kind of pattern to this. I should be looking and diving into what's happening here. I need to spend more time diving into these equipment uh, repairs and maintenance to know what's going on. Um, we did this for a company as a short story. We found that there was a equipment repairs and maintenance to the tune of a very uh, strange trend. It just kept spiking above and above and above. And we found that a mechanic was buying parts and inventory for his personal use for his personal mechanic shop on the company credit card and was logging it to the company. And we found that there was just fraud happening inside what they were doing. It, it became a way for us to 
find the ways inside the company that was not performing well and there were issues and we found out what it was by looking at these reports. So look for these irregularities and there's explanations for every single one of them. So let's take a look at the profit and loss reports of what we mean by trailing wealth, okay? So first of all, if we just did a snapshot of time, so the top one you're looking at is January through December of 2018. Compare to look at the bottom one, January through December of 2019. Let's just go to the totals. The total at the end of those two things for comparison, our income for 2018 was 762,000, right? Comparing the 2019, it shows 664. Well, that's not a good comparison. It looks like I'm doing worse. Well, mm -hmm. what's missing here? We really haven't showed any reporting on October, November, or December of 2019 because mm -hmm. we didn't have any current, you know, current data there. So we're really not doing a strong comparison of how our company is doing year over year. So that's why we do a trailing 12 months. If we look at a trailing 12 months, look at the top one versus the middle one. So we have September of 18 through August of 19, because that's the latest data we had for 19. We're gonna do a solid 12 month snapshot for that time period compared against all of 18. Mm -hmm. Right now our income, 762 for 2018, now that trailing 12 snapshot is 872,000. Our income is showing to be improving and growing and getting higher than it was last year. Our net profit, let's compare the two, was 44,000 in 2018. It's showing 69,000 in, in that snapshot of trailing 12. If I'm tracking a trailing 12 months, I can see a trend whether my business is starting to perform better or worse compared to the last time we had a full snapshot for a year. This is the absolute way to start tracking your data and start seeing there's trends, right? So that's where we start going, the trends of also the cost of goods sold, the gross profit, and where we're seeing improvements or where we're seeing decline in our companies. Jim, any, any specifics you would want to add to that? This is, this is a game changer. We looked at this report and every time we close a month as a leadership team, we close a month, we're looking at these reports and we do the trailing 12 month over, period of, over these periods of time. It helped us change a lot inside of the companies we work with and the companies that we've managed. I know the, the, the purpose of this, you're right, we did look at this. I think that for the purpose of the explanation here today, we were doing January through December 2018 versus trailing 12 September through August 19. The reality is, is if we were comparing and running the business, we would have run September 17 through August of 18 as a comparison. But the whole mm -hmm. purpose of why we use this example today was really just to show you how the, the revenue is growing. So we went from 762 to 872, so we see a trend. Um, we, we work with peer groups all the time, and the peer groups, we always look at trailing 12 months per the quarter. So we would always look at, let's just say, full year 18 versus trailing 12 through the first quarter of 19, through the second quarter of 19, through the third quarter of 19. So you can see trending what's happening across the board. So we don't take it a quarterly at a time, um, going back to the full year um, beyond that. It's, it's just getting a comfort level of looking at your P&L and understanding what's in the line items. And to your point earlier, looking for the irregularities that you're seeing on the line items. You know, I can tell you, you know, I don't know where bookkeeping's done inside your businesses or whether you do it yourself or whether you have an office manager or you outsource it. The reality is whoever's inputting the, the data is only as good as is the data that's being handed to them. If you tell them it's materials, they're going to put it in materials. If you tell them it's on-road fuel, they're going to tell you it's on-road fuel. By the way, somebody's cleaning the window behind me. This is absolutely hilarious. I don't know if that's <laughs> um, and we're on the 14th floor of a building in Dallas. Um Anyway, and, and the only person who's going to recognize that is either the owner of the company or the person who runs the division, because there's a lot of transactions that take place out there every day. And the only person or people or should be a leadership team of sorts or the owner who understands where those where those expenses are. So we can teach you how to look at reports. We can show you what should be happening on a daily basis, but understanding and get a comfort level where the categories mean, seeing those trends that Jason's talking about and asking questions. Uh, we'll get you there. I'll, the only other thing I want to mention to you is you talked about anything that was plus or minus 20%. I agree with you 100%. When you start doing this, if you've got a category, materials, you know, truck repairs, something went up more than 20%, you need to understand it. But as you get really, really good at this, you'll you'll be able to understand plus or minus 5%. Uh, but you got to start. 20% is a great place to start. Mm -hmm. So if you're wanting to see how you see, look at this in QuickBooks, there's some obvious ways to go through the reporting side of this. If you look at you want to display your columns by month so you can mm -hmm. see each month, month to month. You want to select the period. You can do this for a fiscal year. 
based on the last month that you want to end by. So if you go to a, you know, your last most uh, completed time on this one, I mean, this says 2015, but let's just say it's 2019, it's 1231 of 19, you've got all the last year, that would be your fiscal year, even though it's a calendar year. Um, or it might be February the 29th this year. You put February the 29th in there and it'll go a full 12 months back. And you want to separate this by month. And then you do it accrual base. So one of the other ones I want to point out, the accounting method is accrual base. So you can see truly how you're matching expenses and revenue in the same months to get an accurate way of looking at how your business is performing. Cash would be all over the place depending on when you're collecting the cash. Yeah. All right. So we have time now that we can we can entertain questions we can have a dialogue about some of the things that you may be working through inside your companies i will say i'm glad you're here with us today i know that with all the things that are happening in our world with covid 19 and how you're addressing your business maybe this is triggering you to get on more webinars and to look at your company and your financials a whole different way and i'm glad it is but these are things you should be doing regardless of covid 19. And so I'm glad that we're here with you today to talk about the daily things you have to do and how it rolls up to something as big as your trailing 12 months, your profit and loss management, and how you're looking at your business and how it's performing every single time you close the month. And we're excited to be with you as a resource to help you with any questions you have. And certainly we can offer um, some contact information here for you to reach out to us to provide you with, you know, uh, maybe some chart of accounts advice or specific things that we can help you with those those particular those two things that Jim and I mentioned earlier in our in our presentation. Yeah, that be the, the two things that we mentioned, which was the payroll and the period where it belongs. The other was the processing of deposits and making sure they're a liability. But the third piece that you dabbled there in a second ago was is a, a standard chart of accounts. We have a standard chart of accounts that we use. Um, mm -hmm. and it's a standard chart of accounts that is a little bit premised on what the National Association's doing. Uh, in regards to how to recognize revenue, um, but we have our own uh, spin on it and happy to share that with you too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, all of these pieces, you know, uh, you've got to get your hands dirty with this. And a lot of times this is uh, bookkeeping is something that gets delegated to. Building your confidence as a leader uh, to run your firm, to eventually maybe buy another little firm or sell a division of your firm or buy real estate. Understanding what these financials are is, is a life skill. This is this is something that you're going to be able to use no matter what you're a part of or or what you're facing or things like you know and right now in the U.S. falling for loans because of COVID. I mean you have to understand all these principles and getting that confidence level is important. Um, we, we've got a number of bookkeeping clients that we keep the books for. We process everything that we discussed here in the same manner, and we do um, we, we we coach monthly with the team, um, with the leadership team of those companies to help them see the trends that we're seeing, teach them to identify trends, take on uh, the, the financial acumen that's needed to be running the business. And we also compare those uh, financials against other companies that we do uh, the finances for as well. So you can not only see your own trends, but then you can say, well, wow, this, this doesn't look right for me. And we're right, like, yeah, it doesn't. And it doesn't look that way for any of our other bookkeeping clients too. That'll help. Big picture on all of this is that um, the Element Partnership, um, we met Dave um, last year. We've been working with Element for quite some time, but actually just started to, to, to forge the relationship from a partnership perspective because a number of our clients are on the platform. But the ability to track time, you know, costs inside jobs, the whole nine yards, the estimating side of what they've got is fantastic. Um, we're excited to be a part of, of this with a number of our clients and the integration with QuickBooks um, in our mind, it is, is about as good as it gets from my standpoint of, of processing transactions. And so it's definitely a partnership that we appreciate from a standpoint of we understand the whole QuickBooks out of this thing. And implementing mm -hmm. that and getting the right habits in place from a um, from element perspective, from an estimating all the way through job completion, invoicing, et cetera, is key. So we're really excited to be on board with LMN and uh, helping out on all sides that we can. Absolutely. And we do have some questions coming in. And so... Let me, let me just kind of go through the question so everybody can hear what's going on. There was a question from a, a audience member, when doing the trailing 12 months, would you do the report and dollars change, meaning comparison with dollar changes or with percentage numbers? Would you do that? Which one, both or why? You know, Jim, I can take you through what I would do and I can certainly use your advice on this too. We go through the scenario I like percentage change. When you talk about plus or minus 20%, when you're categorizing these, these trailing 12 months or these monthly P&Ls, you're gonna look at your dollars 
obviously, but your change in percentage is when you're going plus or minus 20%, or like Jim said, when you really get honed in on your numbers and it's plus or minus 5%, those are really those, those are going to be your red flags to go after it and go click into it and see what the things are inside that are causing that to be less or plus or minus what you were expecting. And that's why we'd choose percentage change. Would I agree you, with you want that. Anything to that, Jim? No, nope, Mike, right on that. And uh, exactly look at that. So another question came in about cost of goods sold posted to the month's work performed. If you close your books for the year prior and a bill comes in late, where would you post it? I think that might be an exception. So I'm, I'm going to take you through two sides of this real quick. If your cost of goods sold, the Jason example earlier for the tree work that you build for in March and you get the invoice, I think you use the date April the 10th. I know people ask about you're pushing a bill back in the prior period. How do you track that? It's a good question. We actually date the invoice, excuse me, the vendor bill 331. And then when it says the vendor bill number, let's just say the vendor bill number was A, B, C, D, E. Uh, we would do A, B, C, D, E in parentheses behind it, put April the 10th so we can track internally when those, when the, the bill came in for us because you may choose to pay it at a later date or something like that. So you're matching up that way. If you truly have closed your prior year books and an invoice comes in, I would not put this in the standard portion of your p and I would make this an other expense or an other income below the net income because that's a yeah, but that I don't want to explain all of a sudden why January, for instance, uh, cost of goods was so much higher. I mean, it still applies. You still have to pay taxes pro or negative on it. But just putting it beneath the bottom line with an other expense is where I would stick that. All right, so this one, Jim, I may need your help with because there's a way to explain this or we may just be able to help provide some of the, the transactional data that you suggested. But with right. being deposits, the deposits are listed as a, a short-term liability, right? So when we've completed the project, how do you make it turn back into income? You essentially have to create another general journal entry. Um, and that's a little more difficult to explain right here, but we will get you the information. So that uh, that email address here at bookkeeping at McFarlandStanford.com, if you ask us for the creating the liability transaction, we're also going to give you the transaction to reverse that back to apply to the invoice in the period that you uh, receive the money. We get the question all the time about where do you apply deposits? There's a lot of different ways you can apply deposits. So I'm just going to address that here, even though it's not a question. If I, if I get a 10% deposit, um, how often should I apply that 10% in regards to the progress billing? Some clients apply 10% of uh, the value of the, the, the progress invoice from the deposit each time. There are others that'll hold that all the way to the very end of the transaction. Both are right, but the transactions that we'll send you, if you want to seek to know what the general journal transactions are to apply the cash appropriately, we'll put that in there for how you do it too. So here's, there's another question with, I think it's a great question because this happens quite a bit. When entering expenses related to the prior month and you're closing the books mm -hmm. and you get a late invoice, right? So you're getting to the point where you're starting to get these late invoices that affect really your profit and loss for the prior month. Mm -hmm. um, even if it's dated, you know, the following month. How do we communicate this to our team members, to our leadership, to people who are responsible for these profit and loss that we're really not doing as good as we want? We are, our, our close date has always been the 20th of the following month. And largely because that's when tax, taxes in the state of Texas were due. And, and based on your state, you may be able to look at that for yourself. But 20th is when we close the books for the prior month. And that is when we started doing our leadership team meetings. Now, we would look at our profit and loss statements done weekly during one-on-one -on -one meetings, during standard team you know, settings where we're working with our leaders and those specific settings, we're looking at those profit and loss statements weekly about what we're expecting in our, in, in our um, sales and what we're expecting on completing the work. Also, major expenses that are out there that we should be aware of and expecting to come our way too. So that's where we would get aligned with our leadership team is in our one-on-ones. But in our closed meetings, our final numbers, it was the 20th of the following month. That's when we that's we expected to close the close the books. So, so I'm going to take this and say pat you on the back for closing 10 days to close. By the way, that's awesome. And the reality is that's the way it should be. However, we happen to work into a world where we do get a lot of these late pieces coming in the door. I will say this to you. It's generally not expenses that are causing you problem. It's cost of goods. It's either materials or subcontractors that send, tend to send invoices late. 
That being the case, one of the, the, the pieces I feel, feel is a very valuable best practice that you can put in place is, is that you're not going to invoice for something that you don't have the applicable vendor material bill for or the subcontractor bill for. That'll certainly entice your salespeople who may be commissioned to make sure that you're getting the vendor invoices or subcontractor invoices in faster. Because if they're not there, why are you invoicing for something? You're setting yourself up for a whole, for a huge invoice that you know are going to come in door because typically a subcontractor invoice is a larger uh, you know, cost to the to the top line of that. So I would institute something like that if you want to keep to your 10th of the month. Because I got to tell you, when you start auditing your books and, and, and to make sure that your materials um, have been billed for or your time has been billed for, um, I will tell you, a lot of companies do not look at that. And when you start looking at that, we've been able to find, gosh, you're going to be shocked over this, 10 to 12% more billings because of this, because there's so many things that we do on job sites that we forget to change order. There's no malintent. People are just going really, really fast. And they're like, I forgot to bill for the extra tree. The only person who's really gonna find the extra tree happens to be hopefully the finance team or you if you're doing the billing yourself to say, the estimate had three trees and we've got four trees. Where's the fourth? Is it in the yard? Why do we buy a fourth? Did we install the fourth? And that should cause you to get that build. And, and the reality is you should have caught that in the time period before your books were closed to begin with. So that was a very long answer to a very short piece there. I commend you on the 10 days to close. I also think you can put some things in place before you're closing the books, before you allow any invoicing to go out to make sure you're not invoicing for things that you've not received the, the vendor bill mm -hmm. for to begin with. Mm -hmm. so. so we've got... How often should you book short-term portion for long-term debt, yearly, quarterly, monthly? <laughs> uh, truthfully, monthly, I, I'm sure Liz, who runs our bookkeeping here, would be just knocking me on the shoulder. The reality is a short-term debt is supposed to be anything that's due within the next 12 months. So um, you can you can pull that off of the short-term debt and take a portion of long-term debt and put it into short-term debt every month. Or the reality is if it's something that's much longer than 12 months to begin with, you could just be pulling that short-term debt from a balance sheet perspective off the long-term liability. So your short-term debt's always correct. I mean, I'd be the answer you're looking for, but that's how we would handle it as a group. Um, because once again, short-term debt's anything that's due within the next 12 months. And I think we've got time for one more question. Um, and you know, and I may have the, the person who wrote this question give us a little more detail. It says, do you stick with the 20% for job costing efficiencies for discussing at length? This may be referring to the plus or minus 20%. I would say if you are, I, the plus or minus 20% are the big ones. Once you start solving the big ones, you're going to minimize that. It's going to go to 10%. Then you may go to 5% right. um, fluctuation like Jim and I, like Jim had mentioned earlier. But anytime you got 20%, those are the the most important ones to look like to look at first because you can make the biggest difference. Those are your cost saving watchdog accounts. You want to say, hey, we really need to take a look at these, you know, scenarios that were 20% over what we need to be looking at because this is our biggest opportunity to make uh, our business perform better. That's a good answer, Jason. So yeah. we'll go ahead and close here. I, you know, all these. The confidence that we have in financials is because we look at them on a regular basis. This is about building confidence in your financials so that you can look at them and understand what happens to be there. And um, understanding the pulse based on what actual measurements are as opposed to what your gut's going on is very important and making sure you're looking at the right measurements before you d determine you're gonna invest in new equipment or new property or things like that. So. Um, we're excited to give the presentation today to kick off this partnership with LMN. You can follow Jason and I on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. They also can follow McFarland Stanford on those four platforms as well. Um, we will get this copy of this presentation to you. Um, the LMN team, Dave, led by Dave, will get this out to you guys, uh, as well as our contact information that happens to be on this slide. We're eager to help if we can um, coach, bookkeep, recruit, or any of the above. Uh, let us know how we can help you guys. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. That was amazing, Jim. Jason, thank you so much for sharing your expertise um, with all of our attendees today. I feel as though you uh, condensed a PhD program into uh, 58 minutes. I know there's a ton more, and uh, we'll have some great engagements with, with everybody after uh, this webinar. And again, we'll make sure that everybody gets a copy of this uh, recording, as well as your contact information. Um, just one item to close. We have uh, made a couple of adjustments at LMN with respect to 
our virtual workshops, our Element Academy, enhanced customer support and free webinars. Obviously the attendees today are getting incredible value. Uh, Jim and Jason listening to you both. Uh, we have uh, a Mark Bradley, uh, CEO of LMN uh, Summit Series uh, occurring each week as well. All of these uh, webinars are free, but uh, essentially we've moved um, our workshops online for greater access uh, worldwide. Um, our online academy continues to provide companies with uh, the best education to obviously help their staff and, and companies achieve the goals that they need um, you know, to, uh, to work on right now. And then our support through chat, email, and phone. Um, our crew is super passionate. We have uh, a number of team members that uh, are from industry as well, and, uh, and we're here to support. So again, Jim, Jason, thank you so much for your time. I think incredible session. Uh, very timely, building confidence in your financials. Um, I will share that, uh, boy, oh boy, do uh, do you, the experts, ever make it look easy? But we all know it's uh, it's a daily rigor, and uh, and it's not easy. It doesn't come second nature uh, to everybody. And uh, really looking forward, like I said, to uh, to uh, the uh, the attendees from today, as well as uh, as many other landscapers out there. Uh, that need to reach out and, and work with you on uh, on their financials and bookkeeping standards. Um, excited to to make that connection. So appreciate your time once again. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. We'll see you later. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the weekend.